Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Beacon House School System, the organizer for School of Tomorrow events, I'd like to welcome you to the final session of this two-day virtual conference. The non-profit SOT event series was launched by Beacon House in 2000 as a part of its CSR and to help inform the direction of the organization while also engaging global communities in conversations shaping the future of schools and societies. I'm Sara The Manik. organizer for School of Tomorrow events. I'd like to welcome you to the final session of this two-day virtual conference. The non-profit SOT event series was launched by Beacon House in 2000. Right. I'm Sara Muneeb, your host for this session. My professional experience spans over a decade and a half. I'm presently looking after the educational concerns of secondary schools, as well as assessments and examinations um, in Beacon House across Pakistan. We are very honored to have Mr. Drew Perkins with us to conduct the workshop entitled Building Knowledge, Building Excellence through PBL. Drew is currently working as the Director of Professional Development at Teach Thought, and he is also the co host of the Teach Thought podcast. A graduate of Michigan State University with a degree in political science, Drew was decidedly against the idea of becoming a teacher. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? With a mother and a grandmother, both educators, a stint of a substitute teacher lured him back into earning a teaching certificate in secondary social studies. Thus began a journey that includes 15 years in a variety of capacities in the classroom and leadership positions in Michigan, California, Texas, and most recently, Kentucky. Drew continues to deliver professional development and speak internationally. He has been lightheartedly referred to as a professional thought stretcher due to his emphasis on leading uh, through inquiry and questioning. Before I hand it over to him, please note that during this workshop, we would urge the participants to share their thoughts by responding to audience polls. You will be able to do so by logging in to live.sotevents.com and clicking on the share your answer tab on the website. Please um, note that you will have one minute reserved uh, for each poll. Also, please note that all the workshop participants will receive digital certificates at the end of the workshop. Now, ladies and gentlemen, over to Mr. Drew Perkins. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be with you all. And um, hopefully the session will go smoothly as we navigate all kinds of uh, technology across the world. And uh, we, we can keep our minds on uh, inquiry and, and the session. I understand there might be a, an interesting cricket match uh, happening, but, but if we can uh, keep our focus here, that would be wonderful. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Teach Thought and Teach Thought PD and uh, our session, obviously, throughout most of this uh, this uh, hour or so. And then we're going to end with a QA. and a So looking forward to answering some of your questions, hopefully. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen as uh, we go along here. Um, as Sarah mentioned, uh, I'm the director of Teach Thought PD for uh, professional development. We have two websites. If you're not familiar with us, teachthought.com is our main website. Our professional development site has we grow teacher is wegrowteachers.com, and so you should be seeing that on the screen. And we do all of our work of professional development through the lens of inquiry because we really strongly believe in it. And uh, the bulk of our work is in project-based learning. We certainly do other areas, uh, work in other areas like differentiated instruction and growth mindset and uh, assessment literacy and so on. You can find out more there on uh, wegrowteachers.com if you are interested. But today we're going to focus on project-based learning and specifically as we think about project-based learning, some of the things that um, maybe even are a response to some criticism. And as Sarah mentioned, I, I do host a Teach Thought podcast. So if you are uh, able to listen to podcasts on uh, iTunes and Apple Podcasts and all of the, the, the main uh, I, uh, podcast outlets as well, and you can just search for that Teach Thought podcast. It's also on wegrowteachers.com. But anyways, one of the things that I think is, and I talk about this on the podcast uh, quite a bit, is 
a valid criticism of project-based learning and the ways in which inquiry or constructivist, sometimes called progressive learning, uh, is, is, uh, is handled and, I guess, implemented and designed. And one of those criticisms is that it is sort of knowledge light <clears throat> or doesn't deliver on knowledge. And so when we work with schools and teachers, uh, and we do work internationally, we do a lot of work in the United States, but of course do work internationally and have worked with the Beacon House School in uh, Lahore, Pakistan in the past on project-based learning as well. We really want to emphasize and think about how do we design and architect projects in ways that help teachers really connect the work of students and the thinking and learning of the content or the unit or the lesson, whatever it is you want to talk about or how you want to talk about it, but that's the project. How do we connect the work in ways that help students learn the important content Sometimes people call it knowledge in ways that is not just what we would call focal knowledge. So for that particular event or a test or something right in front of them, but something more like tacit knowledge where they can use it in a variety of situations. Sometimes people call that transfer. And so uh, we're going to I'm going to focus a little bit of this or most of this session on that and how we think about that and how uh, that might be different from some of the other project based learning professional development and models and work that's out there. Um, as we get started, though, I, I do want to kind of give a little bit of background and share some some uh, some work as. As uh, Sarah had mentioned, I was a teacher for 15 years in a variety of settings, special education, all the way up to advanced placement here in the States and in a number of different places. And uh, my mother and grandmother were teachers, and I tried very hard not to be, but I was lured back in um, after doing some substitute teaching. And so uh, I, I really uh, do miss the classroom in sense of not being able to have that relationships, uh, those relationships with students, but I do enjoy the work that I do with teachers around the world in, and hopefully this session kind of as an example where we might really be thinking about how do we help teachers grow their practice as we prepare students for the modern world. So as we think about that framing in the context of the modern world, and in the sense of project-based learning, when we do our workshops, we definitely try to model the sort of best practices of project-based learning. We're not going to do a full project here, of course. We've got a, an hour session, but I do like to model some of those pieces that we think are important. One thing that in a project we want to do is some sort of an entry event or entry hook that gets the students into the project, helps them understand the project, uh, maybe why it's a problem worth working on, the context. Uh, one criticism of, of uh, project-based learning is that students can't ask questions about things they don't know much about, which I think is very true. So an entry event or an entry hook can help with creating some of that context and some of that background knowledge and activating some of the background knowledge that they might actually have. So I'm going to start us off with just a short video here that kind of sets the scene for why we think project-based learning can be really, uh, is really important in preparing students for the modern world. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, as, as I said, we like to model some of the pieces of project-based learning in our work. And so I'm gonna ask you, and I know that it looks like some of you have already started responding to the poll that uh, we have shared with you on Slido, but on a scale of one to five, and thinking about prepar uh, preparing students for the modern world, uh, here's a question. How well is, and do you think school in general, which you can think about school as a sort of global enterprise, could be in your country, in your, your uh, district, in your school, or even your teaching, uh, just to sort of think about this. On a scale of one to five, with five being the best, um, how well do you think school is preparing students for what we might uh, think of as the modern world? And that, that video, I think, is uh, an interesting way to think about that, right? So are we seeing uh, an increase in artificial intelligence and robots that might take some of the work and jobs? What will the students that are today's students, but uh, tomorrow as adults, what will they, what will their world look like as far as work and, uh, and all of the other facets of life? And so thinking about the ways in which that, that, that uh, modern world, the demands that the modern world will uh, ask for, and, and again, sort of demand, what are the things that, that we needed to, uh, to do to prepare them for that world? Um, many times teachers think about this and, and think, well, depending upon how traditional our school is and what our schooling looks like, um, they, they give a variety of different responses and usually not particularly high in the score because it, it, maybe it makes sense to think about this as sort of spectrum, right? So on one end, we have sort of very traditional, very teacher-centered, what we would call push teaching. The students are much more passive in sort of receiving information, perhaps sort of test prep, very oriented towards test prep and accountability and scores. And the, the students are really, again, just sort of passive consumers. That's one end of the spectrum. And then all the way in the other end of the spectrum might be uh, sort of very free school kind of uh, situations where you might see students really just learning whatever they're interested in and guiding their own learning with an adult that might be there to sort of help facilitate and provide resources. Most schools are somewhere in the middle, right? And where your school is and where your teaching is, is very likely somewhere in the middle. Um, again, I do think there's there's some val validity to the criticism of people who say progressive teach uh, uh, inquiry based constructive te constructivist teaching is not delivering the sort of content knowledge that we really need to to have students wrestle with and think about. Um, and I think that's a valid criticism. And and I advocate for I jokingly say no, we don't want free range chicken, right? Kids just sort of wandering aimlessly without any particular uh, guidance or uh, sort of push and, and design by the teachers. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think we want a very, the other end of that spectrum where, where the students are passive consumers. So finding that sweet spot in there that will help you think about 
uh, how do we prepare students for the modern world? One of the things that we really truly believe in is the power of inquiry and the necessity of students being able to ask the right questions and ask the important questions and identify the important questions in any given problem, in any given, um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, Sarah, if you would just uh, switch the screens now, that'd be fine, thank you. Um, it, so in any given uh, content area, in any given unit, what are the most important questions that we should be considering? Which, of course, you have to have significant knowledge in order to do that. Uh, not just knowing the knowledge, but at, what, what are the important questions that one should be considering in that, in that sort of process? Because the world is not short of problems, and certainly it, it's arguably uh, going to present us with much more and more complex problems. And thinking through those problems through, with a lens of inquiry will help us sort of decode them and frame them in ways that will be very, very helpful, um, as opposed to just having knowledge that would uh, not necessarily help us do that. Okay. Um, so I do want to direct you to, uh, just as a resource, uh, in case it's helpful, we, we have a, a workshop page, a tools and resources page, and this is the, the uh, website, um, wegrowteachers.com forward slash PBL workshop. If you want to uh, go here, it is free. This is the, the page that we use in our uh, project-based learning workshops. You'll see four tabs across the bottom and just a quick orientation. We have project planning documents that, that show up as Google Docs and it forces you to make your own copy. So you can certainly use those. The PDF versions are there as well. Um, we use uh, project quality guide tools, our project-based learning rubric, some of the things that we use to, to refine and uh, get the, the projects to a better level of craftsmanship as we work through that process. Uh, we do have some links in there and I would, uh, we may get some time to talk about the straw project exemplar project, but feel free to uh, jump on that page there. And what you can do is uh, click that straw project exemplar and there is a planning document for an exemplar project that might be helpful uh, as teachers can sometimes look at those projects and say, all right, how do I replicate this in my classroom with a different content area, topic, driving question, all of that. And then the last tab is a, a tool that we use called Tag Packer. Sometimes people are looking for resources that are outside of our website. So we curate them and we put them in here with certain tags and you can search tags, you can click on tags that will refine and filter out certain, there's uh, videos and projects and ideas and all kinds of resources that we curate there as well. So uh, many times when we talk about PBL, we ask teachers and schools and leaders to think about what do we want from our project-based learning? What do we want it to do? What do we want it to do for students? And what do we want, to, want it to do for uh, the adults, so, you know, the teachers, the administrators, the parents, whoever those stakeholders might be? Um, sometimes it uh, can, it, well, very often is a, a wide variety of answers. But one of the things that we often hear is we want to do PBL. We think PBL will help us, all of the stakeholders here, to, to better engage our students. And I think that's certainly important and worth taking a look at. But I also think it's important to uh, differentiate between cognitive engagement and behavioral engagement. Behavioral engagement, of course, being that the kids are interested, that they are, they are uh, paying attention, that they find it fun or they find it interesting. Uh, all of those are worthwhile pursuits. Uh, I certainly, I have two daughters, uh, 12 and 14. I, I think it's great when they have fun in, in school, but not everything is fun. And if, if that is the goal that we're after in all settings and we're designing for everything to be fun and, and super you know, highly engaging and hands-on and all those kinds of things, which again, I think are good. Um, I think there's there's a little bit of a fool's gold there, uh, as opposed to really also being considerate and thoughtful about cognitive engagement. OK, so how are we engaging them in a, in a thinking process and learning how to ask questions and being critical thinkers and with significant content and knowledge, not just sort of, again, the free range chicken. So we want to think about how do we design and plan and how do we work through this pro, pro, uh, excuse me, project and process. Uh, when we do our workshop, it's generally a three day process. And so we really want to focus on how do we design quality project based learning? What are the principles and, and characteristics and, and pieces that we need to have in place before we launch into the project with students? 
And then, of course, we want to think about how do we teach and scaffold and assess that learning in ways that will be productive, again, towards craftsman-like work. And then how do we manage the project implementation? That's usually what we get into towards the end of the, the workshop. So things like how do we uh, manage groups and help students more autonomously manage and direct their learning and, and the group dynamics that happen when they are working together and hold each other accountable and learn how to have some of those difficult conversations that in, in, in many ways across the globe, we seem to be increasingly struggling with. So again, as we think through the process, we're not gonna focus on all of those pieces today. That's, that's how our workshop looks. But one of the things that we really, really value and I'd like to engage you with, if you're not familiar with especially, is something called the question formulation technique, okay? Question formulation technique is some, uh, we refer to it and they refer to it as the QFT, was developed by the Right Question Institute. And you can see their website there, rightquestion.org. And there's a great book. Uh, I did a podcast, uh, it's been two, maybe three years ago with one of the authors and founders of the Right Question Institute called uh, Make Just One Change. Uh, Dan Rothstein was a, was a guest on the podcast. If you go to rightquestion.org, I believe still that everything that they have is free. You may have to register to get passed uh, into some of the, the resources, but I do believe everything is free. The, the question formulation technique is a great tool to use in and outside of, of project-based learning. And so we're going to engage in that here as, as we work through some of the pieces that um, are connected to building knowledge through PBL. And just the, the, the very first part, and it's a several step process, which is to, to generate questions. OK, so I'm going to share with you and I believe uh, we'll share with you as well in a, a text poll um, in a few moments here. Once once we uh, once I kind of set this up. Uh, a question focus, which is essentially a prompt, right? It is something that we can use to, to get and generate a load of questions and thinking from participants, you in this case, but uh, in students' case, of course, the, they, they would be the, the ones generating the questions. And so the rules are to ask as many questions as you can. If we were together and doing this sort of live or in breakout rooms, we'd say, don't stop to discuss, judge, or answer any of those write every question down exactly as stated, especially if you're on a, a sort of chart paper or a whiteboard or something like that. And if somebody is scribing and writing down uh, what people are saying, as opposed to everybody just sort of jumping in, what we want to do is to change any statement into a question. Now, there might be some conversation, certainly, that can help generate more questions, but we don't want to get into a large discussion here, as opposed to generating lots of questions. Okay, so as we are talking about knowledge and building knowledge in project-based learning, we, uh, I'd like you to, um, the, the question focus I'd like you to engage with and generate questions from in the live poll that I think Sarah has, has shown is knowledge is an indicator of educational success, not the aim. And this was, uh, as you can see, if you're, uh, I don't know if you're seeing the, the uh, screen that I'm sharing at, at this point, but this was a quote from Grant Wiggins who uh, had passed away several years ago, but did great work in education and was a friend of, uh, of Teach Thoughts, certainly. So if I can get you to, in that poll, to start generating questions. Um, and so all of your responses should be questions that are, that this statement makes you think of, okay? So if you're putting, um, uh, statements in here, try to turn those into questions. What questions does this statement, knowledge is an indicator of educational success, not the aim, generate? So I'll give you a few moments here. You can vote on, uh, you can add those in Slido, right? Should knowledge really be an authentic indicator? It's an interesting question. Okay. Seeing, seeing some pop up here. <clears throat> So I'm seeing um, a couple here that are statements. If we can turn those into questions, right? Um, what questions does this generate? Okay, again, I'm still seeing some statements. Let's see if we can turn those into questions. And so one of the things that we want teachers to do is to practice and think about 
thinking through, there we go, there's a question, thinking through the lens of inquiry. And often teachers struggle with generating questions as we start doing this as well, because we tend to think perhaps differently. We might have been trained a little bit differently. Okay, so is knowledge and aim of educational success? What is the gateway to achieve the goal? Success stand for? Can knowledge be the measure of educational success? To what extent knowledge can be considered as an indicator of education? Right. Some good questions here, right? Is the key, okay. So seeing a, a statement in there, see if we can turn that into a question. <clears throat> so as those questions continue to come in, uh, I want to just kind of walk through the steps of the question formulation technique, um, how knowledge can help you to be, to succeed, educational, okay. Uh, we're not going to do all of the steps of the question formulation technique, but just to give you an idea of the, the several steps, and it is quite a simple process, and I think a very important process, something you can do in and outside of question, uh, outside of project-based learning, uh, we would take the next step, which is to mark questions as open-ended or closed-ended, usually with an O or a C. And so this means you have to start thinking about your questions, right? You have to think about them with a critical lens and really think, well, this is an, uh, what is an open-ended question? What is a closed-ended question? And oftentimes what we see our teachers when we do this with teachers is say, what do you, how would you define open-ended or closed-ended? Which of course is a wonderful question that, that I want them to think about. And so it gives them, gives us an opportunity to start thinking and pulling these questions and the thinking that we want them to think about out to make it visible where we can talk about it and really further define it. Uh, then we go into the next step, which is to discuss the advantages of open-ended versus closed-ended, when and why would you use one over the other? And then we ask teachers to, and students when we do this, to change one open-ended question to a closed-ended one and vice versa, change a closed-ended question to an open-ended question. Again, so we're working with these questions. We're having to actually think through and do some of the sort of critical thinking and evaluation and analysis and synthesis of it, if you think about it in the terms of Bloom's taxonomy. Then we ask to prioritize those top three questions from each group. So we might have five or six groups in a workshop. And what we'll see is um, what are the, the questions that are most important? Now, we don't give the, the criteria for how these questions are gonna be prioritized, which means again, the group has to think through what are the questions that are important? Well, how do, how, what are the criteria? What are the things that we need to consider as most important? So again, it's really sort of put, uh, forcing the group to think through and, and really deal with the, the sort of complexity of questions and what they value. And then the last, last piece, which would be to reflect on the questions. Uh, what did you find? Uh, what rationale did you use? From where in the process did your top three come, come from? And so it starts to do a bit of metacognition and reflection. Okay, so that's the QFT. And I do think it's, it's a, a wonderful piece to, to um, uh, to use in your classroom. It's super easy and again can be used used in and outside of, of the, uh, of, the of, of a project-based learning environment or outside of that. okay. So um, hopefully that's helpful and I would I would uh, advise you to check out Right Question Institute and rightquestion.org if you want to know and for more information about that. So, Again, we think knowledge is really important. And I do think that that, again, is a very valid criticism. So when we do projects, we wanna do them well, right? If we're going to do just what we, what we sometimes see as projects, those often don't help think, uh, students think through the complexity and, and really deal with content and knowledge in ways that are really rich. And, and so that's what we wanna do. We wanna get away from projects and more towards quality project-based learning that gives an opportunity for that deeper learning through the projects, not just doing something, right? And so I'm going to explain a little bit about that, but projects might be uh, best described as sort of the science projects that we often see, at least here in the States, of uh, make a volcano or a solar system with styrofoam balls or something like that. 
So as uh, those are not necessarily bad. And I would prefer my daughters do that in school, that kind of thing in school, as opposed to just sitting and listening and sort of passively consuming whatever the teacher is, is uh, putting forth. Um, so we think about how do we shift and how do we take projects and move them towards what we would call deeper learning and, and really include the, the cognitive engagement that I mentioned. And our project-based learning includes five elements, of, of five what we call levers for quality. So rich inquiry, authenticity, autonomy, meaningful assessment, and craftsmanship. Now, all of those are meant to sort of work together in concert to elevate and sort of grow what we call aligned thinking and learning. That very well in a class and a course is your content standards. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be those. So that's why we say thinking and learning. So it could be a genius hour or a passion project. It could be a class where there isn't specific content, but most teachers are working in a situation in a, in a context where they have content standards that they are responsible for and they want their students to think about and learn about. So again, our project-based learning model has these five levers for quality. We really think emphasis on especially getting a really solid hold on using rich inquiry and authenticity to be able to, to, to really grow the knowledge and, and learn how to think about uh, things uh, with a lens of inquiry can be super, super powerful. Um, when we think about, uh, I'll just mention a little bit with authenticity. When we think about authenticity, it is a really important uh, dynamic that I, I think sometimes we see in certain project-based learning models or work, it, it, is, uh, it is sort of overlooked or uh, not featured. We feature it because we really think that it's super important and I'll explain why. Uh, we think about authenticity in general, it's just sort of three ways, right? So is it authentic to the real world? Is it like a real world problem? Are they doing real work for real clients? That kind of thing. That's a wonderful uh, example of authenticity. Sometimes can be very difficult to sort of continue and pull off on a project by project basis, but it is certainly um, something that we think is valuable. Probably more common and, and easier to sort of pull off in, in our K-12 uh, educational settings are, is it authentic to the academic area or industry, right? So are they engaging in work as historians and with historians or with engineers or something that is uh, people who are able to give them feedback on their work with expertise because they work in that field? Now, that, that can look a little different from the younger ages to the older ages, obviously, with more sophistication. But as we think about content and dealing with content and what we want from our students, do we want them as a goal to get to the end of the course or the class or the unit or whatever it is and be able to recite all of the content? Um, do they master 100% of the content? That would be wonderful, but doesn't happen very often. And, and while it's a great ideal, I don't think it's a particularly pragmatically useful ideal. What we want, I think, is to have them engage with the content in ways that they can understand and identify what are the most important questions that we should be thinking about and learning about as we work through this, this content, right? So expertise from, let's say, an engineer. And one of the examples that we use a, a video is a wing project. So we have um, you know, young students who are engaged in designing and sharing their, their mock wing designs with uh, aeronautical engineers. Obviously, they're not building real planes for real people. I, I get on planes fairly frequently and I don't want my wings uh, designed by teenagers, right? Uh, but we, uh, we do want them to share that work with aeronautical engineers who can then give them feedback to the quality of their, of their work. So I think that's a very important, that sort of second level of authenticity. It's easier to sort of pull off, but it, it really helps us engage in uh, what we would call rich inquiry. And I'm, again, I'm going to talk about that connection a little more succinctly here in a moment. The last one is to the, is it authentic to the learner? And so does the learner find it interesting, engaging? Um, that is, is um, something that we can see, actually we can see authenticity of all three levels in some projects, but at least one of those areas we want them to be, that project and that work to be gaining, uh, uh, aimed at. And the part of the reason why is because when we look at authenticity, if we have an authentic audience, 
if we're working and our students are working to create something for an authentic audience, what we then have to do is engage in what we call rich inquiry, which is to say, who's our audience? And how do we meet their needs, which means we have to know who that audience is, what those needs are, which means we have to ask those questions. We have to really think through that. And then we have to think, OK, so how do we meet those needs, which gets us to some of the other pieces of meaningful assessment and craftsmanship. How do we know if our work is good? Is it getting the points and the scores and the grades or is it actually meeting the needs of the audience? And how well do we know? How would we know if we meet the needs of the audience? Well, they can give us that feedback and there's a, a multifaceted ways in which they might, that feedback might show up depending, depending on exactly the nature of that project. But the idea is that we have to ask and identify who this work is for, what we're cre creating and producing, who that's for, and then how do we meet those needs and how well have we met those needs as opposed to sort of the points and scores and grades, things that we typically see in more traditional classrooms. Okay, so again, as I think about knowledge and the importance of knowledge, how do we get students to wrestle with and identify the knowledge? Well, as we use driving questions, uh, and I'm going to ask you to engage in a poll here in just a moment. Uh, we're going to do a couple different ones, I think. Um, but we think about how do we uh, design a driving question and design a project that that is architected and really designed and engineered so that we as teachers, as facilitators, can help students um, identify those content questions that we know are important, right? So if we say we're going to do a project, we have these, let's just say for around uh, for an easy number, seven content standards we want them to think about. Certainly much more complex than that and usually is you know something different than that, but just as a as an easy number. So we have seven content standards. How do I get the the students to pull or to to voice those content standards as questions? So what we'll what we'll do is we'll design and we identify those content questions or I'm sorry content standards. If they're not in the form of questions, we want to turn them into questions, and then think about the de deriving question and the project that will allow us to pull those those uh, content standards out as questions and get them up on our need to know list, right? So if we think about and use a driving question like this, and I'm gonna ask you to engage, um, uh, not this, this is not the driving question, sorry. Um, so we're, if we we're gonna build a birdhouse, and this is an example we use in the, in the uh, workshop quite often. If we say, how might we create and market habitats for birds indigenous to our location? Okay, and I think Sarah's gonna open up the, the poll and share that here and say, all right, what are the questions that we need to be asking in order to do this, right? So some of you have ad added things here. So using material available, right? And again, we wanna get these things in the form of questions, right? Some of you are, are the ones that I'm seeing here are statements. What are the questions and things we need to answer, the need to know questions we need to answer in order to create and market habitats for birds indigenous to our location? I'll give a few moments here. Um, some of you are identifying some of the things, but again, we want to put those in questions. What are the, you know, so using material available might be uh, what materials might might we need, right? Um, we can use this, okay, by creating good learning environments, create a good environment. Okay, so um, go ahead and, and uh, again, uh, add your questions. What questions might we need to know in order to answer this question? Um, oh, I'm seeing some here. Um, okay. Give a moment. So go ahead and add, add more questions if we can think about that. What might we need to create them? What might we need to market them? Okay, what are the type of birds in the location? That's a question that's certainly important. What are, so basically, what, what birds are indigenous, right? Um, and with some students, they might need to know what that word indigenous means. Okay, keep your questions coming. Okay, again, I'm seeing statements. We wanna turn those into questions. And we often see this with students, if they haven't engaged in this kind of process before, 
they do this a similar kind of thing where they're adding question i'm sorry adding statements and saying things that are statements as opposed to asking them in questions and that's a skill and muscle we want to build right so what type of specific habitat do we want to create okay that's a question uh what habitats would would fit the birds right um those are the kinds of questions that we might need to know give just a little bit more time here to generate more questions Okay, what are indigenous birds, right? Okay, what materials might be needed to build a low cost habitat for birds, right? Um, so this driving question actually has two verbs in it and uh, create and, and market. If we were just to create, um, we would say, well, you very often say, how, how, how will we create these things, right? Um, great question here about sort of the marketing piece, right? Who are we marketing for? Who is our target audience? And that's a super important question. Uh, what are the weather details in my location, which might need, which might dictate some of the materials and the ways that we build it and create it? Uh, market habitats, okay. See birds of different habitats around. Okay, so now in the interest of time, uh, what is a habitat, right? So some of the, sometimes you can, if you say habitat or indigenous is a content question that we want students to, to learn more about, we put that in a driving question, which sort of pulls it out is what is a habitat, right? Um, okay, we're getting more questions here. Um, so when I design a driving question, I am trying to design it so that I'm pulling out specific questions. Now you may have from your students, and this is what we're seeing here as well in the examples, questions that are outside of the content standards that we're really shooting for. That's fine. And sometimes those, in que those questions are important, uh, but, we, but we really want to get, if we say, these are our seven content standards, we want to get questions that get up on our need to know list that are specifically tied to those because then we go through the process and say, all right, we're gonna work on answering these questions. So if you say, we need to know what, uh, what indigenous means or what birds are indigenous to our location, or uh, we need to know how to, uh, what materials we're going to need in order to do this, then that gives us an opportunity to teach that because we're answering it, okay? And so for example, the need to know is that we very likely would see are things like how do we accurately measure cut and sand, right? Especially if it was a class where they were actually going to build these things. Uh, how do we market and, and do that effectively and target audience, right? So that, that third bullet point is essentially one of the questions that was pulled out in our, our chat box here in our poll. Uh, what birds are indigenous? What habitats those birds? So by design, um, by design, what we're seeing is, um, it is, we're able to, I'm able to pull out questions that, uh, that I want you to think about and I want you to learn about and I'm going to teach about. And so sometimes people make a, what I would call a false dichotomy, a false binary of constructivist project-based learning or direct explicit teaching. And let me be clear, good project-based learning and inquiry-based learning includes a healthy amount of direct or explicit instruction. That's a false binary. It's a false dichotomy. If you're not doing some direct instruction in your project-based learning experiences, you're probably missing some opportunities to actually help the students develop a, a set of knowledge, right? Is it all direct teaching and all explicit knowledge, explicit teaching? Of course not. It's a healthy balance, right? So um, as we think through the, the, the work, let me give you another example to work through. Okay, so I think Sarah's, gonna, she'll put this up. Here's a driving question, and let's see what you come up with here. So what are the questions? And uh, see if we can do just, just questions as responses here, now that we've practiced one. Um, how might we redesign K-12 education to better prepare students for the modern world? What questions would you need to see um, or need to know and answer in order to answer this driving question? How might we redesign? I think uh, Sarah's pulled that that uh, poll, poll up on our screen here. 
What are the questions we might need to know in order to redesign K-12 education to better prepare students for the modern world? And I've shared a, a, uh, uh, an image that some of you may have seen. So purpose, curriculum, practices, systems that might help me guide that discussion. So um, I'll wait here for, for just a moment. And I know we're, uh, I want to honor your time as well. But what are the questions that we need to know in order to redesign K-12 education to better prepare students for the modern world? Questions only. Give you a moment here. What is K-12 education? Okay, so we're starting to get into the um, some of the definitions and making sure we, we understand what those terms are. Okay, who's the target audience, right? Um, certainly could be an important question. Some skills, right? So we need to start thinking about um, what, what the modern world is going to, to uh, demand, right? Um, what are some of those other questions? Requirements of the modern world, good, good. Okay, give just a little bit more time here on these questions. Okay, again, I've seen a few statements in there. We want those statements to be questions. So if you're putting statements in, I would prompt you and ask you to, to um, think about what questions would be important. Okay, oh, is there a better way to prepare students for the modern world than K-12? That's a, what I would call a beautiful question. It makes you really think. What are the skills for the modern world, right? Um, again, one of the things that uh, if I were doing this live and if uh, we were able to see multiple screens, because I don't think you can see my screen now, and that's fine, you don't need to change it back here, uh, is to think, all right, what uh, we've got purpose, curriculum, practices, and systems. And those are up very explicitly because it gives me an opportunity to think about and help guide that and say, what about that? What about the purpose of school, right? So it gets us thinking about the purpose of school and asking about the purpose of school. What are the curriculum pieces? What are the questions that you might have around curriculum? And what about the practices and systems and those kinds of things? So um, there's a, a uh, and, and Sarah, if you don't mind switching the the uh, screens again, back to the need to knows. Thank you. So some of those questions that you asked, I anticipated and that was by design, right? So what's the purpose of K-12 education? I mentioned that, but what will the modern world demand? Several questions about that. What should students learn? Uh, what systems and practices will help us meet and need um, um, uh, meet the needs of uh, sort of the modern world. So again, we want to identify the content and knowledge we want students to think about and learn about that cognitive engagement. And by design, we we create a project and a driving question that helps us pull those out as need to know questions. And once we have them up on our need to know question list, then we can work through the process as the project unfolds to learn about those specific questions and sometimes, again, do what we would call direct or explicit teaching there. Okay, so um, it does give us an opportunity to not only develop and, and include that content knowledge, but also learn the content or learn the skill of identifying the questions. Uh, as a teacher, as a facilitator, you very well will want to be pulling uh, sort of uh, uh, maybe re rephrasing or paraphrasing questions uh, to, to get them uh, the language of maybe a little bit more refined, especially towards the knowledge you want them to think about. Uh, there's a fine balance there between being manipulative, um, but also being helpful and modeling how a thoughtful adult thinks through these things in the form of questions. Okay, um, And I know I, I want to get us to uh, our, our question and answer session here, but one last thing before, because I, I've mentioned pull teaching, um, the Bloom's taxonomy, of course, is something that lots of teachers are familiar with, and I think it's a simple, easy way to think about this. Um, certainly not the only way, uh, but as we think about projects and teaching, and again, that spectrum. So uh, what we um, 
what we what we see as the understand and remember pieces, these bottom pieces of this sort of pyramid, this hierarchy, uh, that's our content and knowledge. That's the things that we want students to understand, think about and remember. Right. So what we want to think about and, and most again, the spectrum, let me let me back up a little bit. The spectrum of more traditional teaching sort of stays at and loiters at that those bottom two areas of Bloom's taxonomy, the understand and remember. Uh, Project-based learning, what we want to do is to really think about how do we design and then enter into the project with students at the top. So we talk about this, and this is a blog piece that I've written. If you want to look it up, it's uh, on both of our sites, our websites, but um, Flipping Bloom's Taxonomy. So we, when, when students enter a project, we want them to start at the top by asking them with a driving question to create something. Now that could be design, assemble, construct. There's all kinds of verbs that can take the place of create. But we ask them to start, We in our planning, we've started with the understand and remember. With students, we start them at create and say, how can we create this, right? And we use that driving question and we use the need to know process to identify the things we need to understand and remember as our need to know list. And then through the project, we're applying, we're analyzing, we're evaluating, we're working with that content knowledge in ways that help us to a more tacit knowledge, not just a focal knowledge, something for a test and for that specific task that you're doing right then and there. So as we think about pulling and pushing, um, this dynamic of really sort of delivering content and pushing information out at students where they uh, are often not behaviorally engaged and often aren't cognitively engaged versus questions which help you uh, sort of engage students behaviorally often, but, but more importantly, cognitively. So I don't like to think about it in sort of uh, education as sort of market and, and economics, but I do think this analogy helps. And I, as a teacher, remember feeling like this sort of top version of the pushy salesman, right? How am I trying to get you to, uh, to uh, get buy in? And, and this is important, right? Students often ask, why, why is this important? Why will I, how will I ever need this, right? So as a teacher, you're sort of pushing information out and sort of being the pushy seller, you're trying to sell them on, on why this is important versus a pull system where you are creating a project and using inquiry and driving questions that are sort of asking students to ask those questions, inviting them. And those questions then drive the demand and say, all right, I'm going to teach these things today, tomorrow, next week, whatever, because we've identified their important questions to really think about and learn about. So as we think about that sort of pull teaching dynamic, the inquiry process is super important. And one, la one last thing before we get to our, our question and answer session, because I'm seeing some questions coming in here. Our driving question, um, there's lots to be said, and we work through this in our, in our project-based learning workshops and in lots of our coaching and support options as well. But really being clear in your planning and with students about product, purpose, and audience. What are we creating? Why are we creating it? And for whom? Right. So this what we call a starter template can help you with sort of clarifying those things. And then as you iterate and refine your project, uh, your driving question, it definitely can can um, can uh, you know, be a little bit more student friendly. But you can certainly and we definitely advocate for clarifying those things with your students. So that's an example there. Um, I do want to get to some of your questions here. And Sarah has shared some of them with me. How can we as teachers design PBL tasks and rubrics to achieve objectives? Um, so lots to say about this. Uh, we are, um, I'm a huge advocate of what, what we call single point rubrics. And when I think about single point rubrics, um, we think about, all right, how do we, um, and then I will share this slide. This is a blog piece that you can certainly find on our website. We think about um, identifying and simplifying the, uh, the the things that we're after, right? So the middle column is really what we're after and using instead of quantitative statements, qualitative statements of what we're after and the effectiveness, right? So using those as sort of qualitative guiding statements and then the things that students are doing, the, the evidence that we might collect that either says they're doing this well or maybe not, right? So 
uh, clarifying your objectives and doing that in a single point rubric and putting those things in. If we want students to collaborate effectively, that could be an objective, right? That we ask them, we, we use in our rubric uh, guiding statements about effective collaboration, or if we want them to have uh, depth of understanding in this, this um, substance, the middle piece here on this rubric that you might be seeing on your screen, how do we help them understand with a depth of understanding as an objective, the, the content and, and knowledge, uh, the concepts and questions, and then look for evidence as opposed to putting the evidence in the, in the rubric and then sort of trying to pick off things and bullet points and put numbers on them. Uh, lots to be said about that and certainly uh, not enough time here to do that. Um, so seeing several questions, that one's a little redundant school. Blah, blah, blah. Um, how can we manage the time to complete the delivery lesson? Okay, this is a really good question. Um, as I would, I think about imp it really important in your planning process, um, put things in a sequence, put it into a calendar, whatever format you might want to use, but where do you want to be? Where's the end point? And then work backwards. Uh, sometimes we see teachers trying to, what do we say, build the plane as we're flying it, right? So, uh, I really think it's important to have your planning all laid out as much as possible, as the we might say the signs of teaching, so that we are able to sort of uh, flexibly and fluently work through that project. We know the roadmap that we want to keep students on. And so we're really making sure that we are keeping them on that cognitive path. And if you sequence it out and sort of, uh, you know, put it into a day by day kind of uh, sequencing. And I advocate for thinking about on which days are you trying to deal? Uh, what are the questions, the need to know questions, the content, also known as content um, that we want students to think about and learn about on these days? What am I going to teach? And that's the scaffolding process. Uh, some of our planning documents help with that. But having that done in advance of starting the project is super important because if you're if you're trying to figure that out as you're going, that's a recipe for, um, you know, project based learning not done well, sometimes uh, meeting the criticism that that is often given to uh, to project based learning. Um, so how to compose a class in a good matter if students are not re responding according to expectations. Um, so sometimes, and again, a criticism with project-based learning and in, uh, constructive education is that students don't, don't know how to ask questions about, they can't ask questions about something they know nothing about. That I believe is true. So sometimes you don't know what their background knowledge is. And sometimes you do need to fill in some of that context and give them more knowledge and give them things to think about phenomena, which it might be a video, it could be a, a reading, it could be a guest speaker, it could be a field trip, lots of things. Um, with every kind of instruction and, and whether it's more traditional or not, that you often are, what you perceive is going to happen very often doesn't. So you might need to, again, if you have your plan in place, you can do some flexible shifting and fluence shifting uh, to meet those needs and, and try to pull that. Uh, now, there, there are some times certainly that students and project-based learning is not going to fix this. Nothing is going to fix this. They may not respond the ways that we want them to. That's, that's human nature. Uh, there may, may be things outside of school that are, are getting in the way. It could be that the project that you've designed that you thought was really going to be engaging isn't. And that happens to the best of us. It's happened with me. Can you shift and can you be transparent with your students and say, all right, we're going to shift gears a little bit here because I think I've missed the mark. Uh, I don't think about myself as an expert in much of anything or really anything. I think about the terms of expertise, right? Do I think about and learn about and, and talk about project-based learning more than most people? Yeah, so I have expertise. Do I have all the answers? Am I always right? No. And the same thing is true of teachers, right? You think about how do you uh, be honest and transparent and you don't have to be right about all of those things, right? Um so how can PBL be used to facilitate learner agency? Um, I'm assuming that is sort of related to autonomy. Um, that's the way that we talk about it. Um, when we think about autonomy and uh, students directing their own learning, uh, 
there is a sort of misconception sometimes that and I think teachers fall into this trap of, oh, I have to give them full autonomy all of the time. Otherwise, I'm not doing it well. Uh, this slide sometimes helps with teachers uh, thinking that. So when we think about traditional teaching, it's very tightly managed and simple tasks. If we think about project-based learning, sometimes people might characterize it as loosely management, loose management of very complex tasks. That's not what we call quality good project-based learning. So we think about if the tasks and things that they are doing are more complex, then you're gonna have to more tightly manage them, right? I use the example of my daughters, they're 12 and 14. They have more autonomy to be able to do things now than they did five, six, seven years ago. Uh, I could, I can uh, provide, uh, you know, let's say, let me use this example. With a six-year-old, you might give a, a six-year-old a, a butter knife and ask them to, uh, you know, cut uh, or slice butter, right? Not a very complex task. I would not give a six-year-old a very sharp knife and say, slice tomatoes. So you manage that autonomy based on sort of the zone of proximal development. What are the things we need to be able to, or they can handle? What's the edge of, the, of, of their learner agency? And sometimes the contracts uh, definitely can help student contracts that we talk about. Uh, those things can be very helpful, um, but we wanna provide opportunities for them to demonstrate that learner agency. We scaffold and support it as much, but as little as we need to and uh, help them in, in the op or sort of correct them and give them guidance when they struggle with it because that's how they learn, okay? Um, maybe a couple other questions. I know we're, uh, looks like we're at the end of our uh, session here. Um, can mindfulness be embedded in a project, see their own thinking in a self-directed way? Um, yes, and of course, that's a big, big, mindfulness is a, is a big, big topic, uh, sort of the metacognition. We're big fans of making thinking visible and the work of Ron Rich Hart. He's been on the podcast a couple of times. We actually use one of their thinking routines in our work as we unpack and think about our project-based learning model. Um, see, I'm pulling up. Here's the making meaning routine that we use. Um, that is one of theirs. Um, so as they think about and make that thinking visible and talk through and work through those things, um, I think that that is uh, super important. And um, okay, uh, so I think we're about ready to wrap it up here. I think Sarah's going to um, uh, take us out. I do hope it was helpful. Um, and certainly a lot more to be uh, thought about and learned about. If you want more information, I encourage you to jump on to uh, WeGrowTeachers.com. You can request information there. You can always email me. Uh, my email is drew at teachthought.com. But thank you so much. And I do certainly hope it was helpful. And back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts and your knowledge about PBL. It has definitely opened up new avenues of exploration for us in terms of pulling profound thinking and deeper learning. Also, um, special thanks to our esteemed audience for their interest and participation in this session, despite the match. But I can assure you that this, wa this was much more interesting. Uh, <laughs> before you log out of this session, please take a minute to share your names and your email addresses on our website. Again, that is live.sotevents.com so that your certificates of participation can be emailed to you. Um, thank you once again, Drew, and thank you to our chief sponsor, UBL. Um, stay positive, stay smart, stay safe. Good night. Thank you.